Sabbath peace. Another opportunity for us to come together and hear and learn of the word of truth that's given to us by the Most High God. All honor goes to the Father through the Son, whose name is Yahushua. In him lies the only hope for salvation. In him lies the only hope for salvation. We know that it is obtained by grace through faith, not of works, lest anyone should boast, and given freely as a gift to all who obey him. We understand that if you do not obey him, it is made manifest or made obvious that you do not believe. In, in this state, you should expect no good thing from the Most High. However, anything that you do get, whether it be a gift of tongue, gift of prophecy, or any supernatural experience you may have, you can and you will be used. It can and it will be used against you in the day of judgment. With that said, peace to the saints that are in the room, to the saints that couldn't make it, to the saints that is watching in on the camera, to the saints in the chat, saints scattered all the way around the world that we don't even know about. But no peace to the wicked. The only thing we say to them is repent that they might live hey hey y'all go in the room y'all be quiet uh man you know i missed the i missed the debate bro i'm mad about that thing man. i completely forgot everybody been talking bad about that thing hmm. they've been talking bad about that thing i was i, I saw a couple clips i was laughing boy i was like oh these boy that boy biden was up there so I was, that was i was like this i was out of line and now uh, you got people everybody freaking out i saw a tweet from obama he is like, everyone has a bad debate, even me. But <laughs> I said, oh, oh, these boys is in panic mode. <laughs> he brought Obama out talking about, hey, a bad debate, it, it can happen. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, that day, when I saw that, I was like, oh, no, I got. I might got to go back and watch this. You know what I'm saying? I wasn't going to watch it. You know what I'm saying? Because Danielle said, you ain't miss nothing important. You know what I'm saying? She said, ain't nothing, ain't nothing important at her. Okay. Yeah, man. Yeah, I was, I was like, yo, I saw, when I saw Obama come out, I was like, oh, no. I've been getting emails. because You know, I signed up to both of their things. I signed up to the to the uh, Republican and the uh, Democrat thing. Yeah. So, so they, they always send me emails about, about you know what I'm saying, who, uh, who want donation. That's all they ask for, money all the time. You know what I'm saying? But they ask, hey, Sister Leticia, how you doing? Sabbath peace. Uh but you know they always uh they always asking for money. So boy, they been going crazy. You know what I'm saying? Apologizing for the debate. You know what I'm saying? Biden got one. He Biden came out. He said in his email, he said, <laughs> he said, Listen, I may not talk as fast as I used to, or this, that, another, but uh, you know what I'm still good at is telling the truth. <laughs> I'm like, okay. <laughs> I'm like, this thing is embarrassing, boy. This thing is, this thing is embarrassing. So, yeah, the homegirl who do surveys, she worked for one of them survey jobs. Yeah. He looking like, yeah, ever since that debate, these people ain't messing with Biden. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Okay. That, thing, that thing's hilarious. I'm about to watch that thing. Yeah, I might have to go back and watch it probably Sunday or something. <clears throat> let's, uh, let's, uh, let's recap. So, last week, we, um, we talked about uh, we talked about what was customarily called the Sermon on the Mount, um, but I like to I like to look at it as these are the details, right? These are the details that the Scripture is giving us, that the Gospel is giving us. When we read a few weeks ago, when the people were saying he taught as one who had authority, right? So now we get an idea of what they're talking about. Like these are the things he is talking. Remember last week. He went on and he started introducing the idea of the kingdom of heaven and it belonging to people. Right. The only thing we heard, we didn't read it, but the only thing that's happened so far is he said, hey, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at, is at hand. Right. That was back in like Matthew four, Luke four. We skipped it. Right. But that's when he first introduced the idea of kingdom of heaven. Then he comes back and he starts saying, hey, blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are, blessed are those that are persecuted, right? Blessed are this, blessed are that. And then and a couple of them, he said, because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So it's like, oh, it belongs to these people. Then he went on to teach you, like, I'm not done with the prophets. I'm not doing away with the prophets or the law. In fact, I come to fulfill it. And he told you that people who break even the least of the, the, the commandments of the law, they're still going to be in the kingdom as least in the kingdom. 
But if you do all of them, you'll be great in the kingdom. So he gave you a scale of this kingdom that he's introducing, right? A people that's going to be least all the way to great. It's going to be levels. It's going to be a hierarchy there. And he's telling you how you can kind of fit into it, right? You start breaking some of the, the commandments, you'll still get in, but you'll be least, right? And then he said, but if you want to be great, you keep all of the commandments. But then he, he came back and he said, but no matter what, your, fair, your, your, uh, your righteousness has to exceed the Pharisees, right? And we're going to talk a little bit more at, throughout the gospel of, of exactly what that means, right? But he's saying your righteousness has to exceed the Pharisees. Then he went on to talk about different, different thoughts in the law and the different things that, that are going on. And he challenged the conventional thought. And he started to teach us how to be perfect, right? So we went into great detail of that. If you missed that study, you go back and watch it. I think it'd be very valuable to you. And it's going to be pivotal to a lot of the stuff that we're going to be discussing going forward when it comes to the gospel. So today, we're going to continue this same teaching, right? So him teaching as if he had authority, he goes on for a couple more chapters. So we're going we're gonna to continue with this teaching. This is going to be like a part two, right? So this is uh, Matthew chapter 6, verse 1. We finished off Matthew chapter 5. This is Matthew chapter 6, verse 1. I want y'all to be quiet in there. Come sit down. This is Matthew chapter 6, verse 1. Take heed that you do not your alms before men to be seen. He said, you. take heed that you don't end up doing your alms before men. What does that mean? Uh, don't be giving me your gifts in, in, in offerings and stuff before people. Yeah, he's saying he's saying don't just give people money just to be seen. When they say whenever you see the book, it say before people are saying in front of. Right. So he's saying don't just be trying to hand out your money in front of people. Right. Keep going. Watch this. Yeah. Uh, wait. Be seen of them. Otherwise, you have no reward of your father, which is in heaven. Therefore, when thou dost thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets. Right. So all these people that be on their phone doing this, you know what I'm saying? They got their selfie going. They say, hey, this is what we're doing. We handed out money and food to the homeless and this, that, and other, da, da, da. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? This, look, look at this. We just feel so great being able to help people. You know what I'm saying? This, that, and other. That stuff is phony, he's saying. He said, listen, if you're doing it for that, you got your reward. You know what I'm saying? I hope you get a couple more likes on your video because that's about all you got. That's the reward you about to get. Like that, uh, that, Drake, that Drake video, that God's plan. What God's plan. You know what I'm saying? That's exactly. That's the that's best example of it. God's plan. That boy walking around giving people handed out money and stuff and doing that thing on a music video. Have you no shame? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> like, goodness gracious. And the money out to poor people on a music video. These people are crazy. But that's what it is. Like, you got your reward. If that's what you're in it for, if that's why the reason why you did it, then don't expect nothing from God is what he's saying to you. Right? If your purpose is to get notoriety and get attention and have people say how great you are and you get all the glory, then don't expect nothing from God. You got what you were looking for because there's going to be some people that say, you know what? Drake is such a great person. Look at him. He ended up all that money. Right? But the most high God respect the ones that do it behind the scenes. Right? You look out for people, you ain't got to say nothing. You know what I'm saying? You don't need nobody to, you don't need no camera to catch what you're doing. Right? Most high God said we should, you know what I'm saying? If you want to, he's teaching us again to continue the theme from last week. He's teaching us how to be perfect. Right? So he's keep teaching us to stay away from all the temp It's tempting if people start looking at you and they start saying how great you are for the things that you do, it's tempting to start believing them. Right. And then your brain get blown up and you start loving the attention and you start love. Y'all is, is trying to teach us through Yahushua how to separate ourselves from wanting that glory. So he's saying resist against it, against it so much so that you do the exact opposite. Right. So he said, instead of doing it before people, resist the, the attention, resist the glory, and do it where nobody know about it. Read it again. Watch this. They he that you do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, you have no reward of your father, which is in heaven. 
Therefore, when you do your alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But when you right, he it, said, them boys let lit the trumpet. They come down the street. Wah, wah, wah. You know what I'm saying? I'm handing out money today. Who is the poorest around? Da, da, da. You know what I'm saying? Our brothers are here walking around like, hey, brother, look, I got you, man. Blow the trumpet again so they know I'm here. Here you go. You know what I'm saying? Here you go. Oh, man, you really look poor. Here, get here, here. You know what I'm saying? You need, let me give you two. You know what I'm saying? It's like, they looking at it like, oh, no, you got what you was looking for. You know what I'm saying? That's why you were doing it. That's why you got it. Right? Keep going. Watch this. But when you do arms, let not your left hand know what thy right hand do it. Right? So he's saying... Don't let you. All right. So think about he's giving you imagery. Right. So think about alms. Alms. When we say alms and when we read in alms, it's talking about, you know, charity. What we consider charity right now. Right. Giving giving money away, giving food away, giving things away to people who need it. Right. People who you think need it. Right. So when you do that, the imagery of doing that is using your hands. Right. You say. You know what I'm saying? I'm giving it to you, and I'm going to give it to you. If somebody on my right-hand side, I'm going to give it to with my right hand. They on my left-hand side, I'm going to give it with my left hand. You know what I'm saying? So the imagery is, I'm doing it. He's saying, be so secretive about how you're doing this, right? That your right hand don't even know what your left hand is doing. Even though it's attached to the same body and the same brain and all that. He said, the way the way you should be handling it is you should be trying to hide it even from your own self. Right? So the imagery there is try your hardest, right? To not let anybody see what you're doing for people. Because if you're doing it for the glory, and there's that temptation to want that glory, then now. That sets you up for failure. But he's saying if you want to be perfect, right? Listen, don't even entertain it. Do it in secret. You're going to get somebody something, you know what I'm saying? Do it behind closed doors and let it just go wherever it go. Right? Keep going. Watch this. That thine arms may, may be in secret and that thy father, which is in secret himself, shall reward thee openly. See it in secret himself shall reward thee openly. Right. The things that we do in secret. Yah will pay back in open, whether it's good or bad, by the way. Right. So if we do it in secret and we do something good, according to God, in secret, then guess what? The most high God will usually exalt us or glorify us or 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 bless us openly in a way that everybody knows it. And that's what it's about. Right. This all requires a high level of trust in God because basically everybody got a motive. Everybody wants something, right? So if I want glory, then yeah, I'm going to do this and I'm going to expect that I get glory back. That's why a lot of people got, got, you know what I'm saying, they, they be having problem with the, you know what I'm saying, what they call one-sided relationships or one-sided friendships and all this mm -hmm. because they do things for each other, right? They do things with, with, with a clear intention of what they expect back. Now, sometimes it's not vocalized because it make the relationship seem too transactional, which, you know, a lot of people want to pretend that the relationship is not transactional. Yo, I don't be having problems with the transactional relationship. People act like that. That is a bad thing. Yeah. I mean, it's an honest it's an honest yeah. way to have a relationship, because at the end of the day, everybody needs something from somebody like, you know, what I'm saying a lot of people, people just value different things over. You know, what I'm saying it's like people that don't like manipulation. It's like, well, you're manipulative. You know, what I'm saying like. Like, everybody manipulates everybody. You know what I'm saying? It's just a certain type of manipulation that you don't rock with. You know what I'm saying? Like, you don't, you don't, you don't rock with the manipulation where people withholding information and controlling your decisions because they're not giving you the whole story. You don't like that. Mm -hmm. You don't like the manipulation where people lie to you to kind of direct you into a certain decision. Like, you don't like that. But all of it is some level of manipulation just by entertaining somebody, just by talking to somebody, just by just by using a little different voice when you're talking to somebody. All that stuff is manipulation. Right. So it's like not all of it is bad. We manipulate our kids. Our moms manipulate our moms and dads manipulated us. 
know what I'm saying? And a lot of that was for our good. You got to manipulate situation. You got to manipulate your coworkers and all this stuff. It ain't always bad. It ain't always lying, right? Lying and manipulating, withholding the information and manipulating is, is, is bad most of the time, right? But when it comes to lying to manipulate, it's always bad. You know what I'm saying? But but when it comes to manipulation, it's not, you know what I'm saying? Some, it's, it's just different. It's different ranks of it. Well, in the same way, we're having transactional relationships are, are a different way to say it is using people, right? Using people, there are different, there are different levels of it. We just we have certain ways of using people that we okay with and certain that we don't. You know what I'm saying? Like if somebody use you to 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 call you and tell you that they love you every day, that's not necessary. We usually won't interpret that as using. But a lot of times, a person that does that, they need to do that, right? They need, and they need you to receive that from them, right? It's something in them that it's like, okay, we know this is, this is what needs to come out of me for whatever reason, whatever their reasons are, you know what I'm saying? It's like, I need to get this off. But then there's sometimes that these people are doing things like that only to get a response from you, right? I'm a call and I'm a text and tell you that I love you every single day. Only because I need you to love me or I need to feel like you love me because I like the response that I get or whatever it might be. There's nothing wrong with that. Right. There is nothing wrong with that. However, we should always be honest that this is the transactional relationship. I'm going to give you this. You're going to do that. I'm going to take care of you. That was a lot of you. Know what I'm saying it's like this generation of men. It was in my generation. You try to hide. You know what I'm saying? You try to hide doing stuff for girl. You know what I'm saying? You try, you know what I'm saying? It's like, listen, you know what I'm saying? Like, no, nah, I didn't buy that for her. You know what I'm saying? It's like, that thing, you know what I'm saying? That thing was like frowned upon. But this generation, it seemed like these boys out here just. And that's the expectation. There's nothing wrong with that, right? However, if you dishing out money because you want something, you want her attention, you want that, and you're pretending that you're just doing it, just because off of the strength, just because, you know what I'm saying, off of the love, well, then now that's icky. Right? Now that's icky. Once you have me like, listen, I'm going to pay for dinner tonight because my expectation is you're going to entertain me and you're going to like me and this, that, and the other. You know what I'm saying? Like, this is this how it's going to go. Okay, well, that's different. You know what I'm saying? That's different. Now you should, it's direct, it's transactional, everybody knows what's going on. Right? A lot of our relationships are transactional. A lot of our relationships are just not honest, right? People are not honest. Like, this is what I need out of the relationship. This is what you need out of the relationship. Are we compatible in that way? You know what I'm saying? Can I give you what you need? And can I get, and I'm not talking about just male, female relationships or romantic relationships. I'm talking about just relationships, mother, father relationship. I mean, uh, mother, uh, mother, son relationships or mother, daughter relationships. Brother sister relationships, best friend relationships, employee relationships, right? It's like it's important to have a clear understanding of what the other does for another. Because otherwise, what you do is you get into a situation where you start expecting everyone to be you, right? I've done so much for you, or I've done this for you, or I would never let nobody say this to you, or I would never let this, that, and the other. And then what happens is, you start expecting them to be to have the same levels of, of morals or the same level of uh, values that you have for you for them. And it's like, that's because y'all wasn't clear. You know what I'm saying? If you were clear with each other about this is what I'm expecting of you and this is what you expect of me, then it'd be like, OK, well, I know this is how far we could take it. Or I know I don't want to be your friend in that way because I can't expect for you to do the types of things I need. Right. And now you have a more honest relationship. Now you have an opportunity to have grace on one another and just say, okay, well, even though I know you can't, you can't give me what I need, I'm still going, you know what I'm saying? I'm still going to be in this relationship because there's just certain things about you that I want to help. And now it becomes a selfless thing. And now that is a righteous thing at that point, right? When, it, when you take a sacrifice, right? That's what giving alms is about. When you take a sacrifice and you say, I'm no longer looking for you to be transactional with me. Now, instead, I'm looking for God to be transactional with me, right? That's when it becomes an alms, right? That's when it, when it becomes something that's righteous, that the most high God will glorify you for, because it's like, oh, no, I'm not expecting anything from my friend here. 
or from this person that I just met or this person that I believe is in need, right? Or my family members, right? I'm no, I'm no longer expecting anything from them and no, I'm no longer doing this to get something from them. My reasoning for doing this in this situation is simply to get something from God. I know they need it. I know I can help. I know I can take the sacrifice, but I know I get repaid from the most high God. And when you operate with that type of faith, it sets you away from what's normal, right? It's three levels, right? It's the, the bottom level is the person that's lying, scheming, pretending that they're doing stuff out of the kindness of their heart. But in reality, they're looking for something back from you, from that individual. There's nothing wrong with it looking for some, some you know, back. However, if you're pretending that you're doing it as a gift or as, out of mercy and really you're looking for something in return from that person, that's wrong. Right. Then the next level is the person that's honest, just like, oh, I'm, this is what I want from you. This is what I'm willing to do. This, that, and the other. Da, da, da. Then, hey, let's let's have this great family relationship, this great romantic relationship. Let's have whatever. And you guys transact. And it's a transactional relationship. And y'all fulfill each other's needs. And sometimes people going to miss expectations and you got to have grace or whatever and work through it. Right. But then the highest level is going to be I'm not looking nothing from you or I'm not looking for these things from you. Instead. I'm looking for it from God. I'm looking for my repayment from God. And this is what Yahushua is trying to teach us, that highest level. All right, keep going. And when you pray, you shall not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But you, right? So it's the same idea. He's looking like, these people like to be in front of people. They stand in the middle of the street or the middle of the synagogue and they pray and they make these long prayers and they try to look and people just say, oh, look how great that prayer was. Look how great that man of God is. Or look how they're like, yeah, he trying to teach you this, that stuff. You know what I'm saying? He's saying resist that stuff. Well, let's see how we should pray. How should we pray, y'all sure? You, when you pray, enter into thy closet and when you have shut thy door, Pray to thy father, which is in secret, and thy father, which seeth in secret, shall reward thee openly. Right? He said, pray in thy closet. You don't have to be in front of everybody. Everybody ain't got to see you pray. He said, resist it. Because that's how you're perfect. That's how you erase the opportunity to even be tempted to do something for the wrong reason. Right? That's what this is about. He's giving you, like, he's giving you the way to stay furthest away from what could even possibly become sin. But to do it in a way that that is it puts everything on you. It don't put the burden on anybody else. It just puts everything on you. Right? That's what all of these teachings are about, right? Is how do you how is what's the perfect way to stay against uh stay away from sin? What's the perfect perfect way to stay away from temptation? And if you do these things then you're ridding this thirst for glory and attention and pride, you're ridding yourself of it, right? Keep going. But when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathens do. They think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be ye not therefore like unto them, for your father knoweth that things that you have need of before you asked him. Right, he, he's no. basically talking about vain repetition. That's basically saying, like empty words that you repeat all right it's another way of saying vain repetition it's just empty words that you repeat so in you know what i'm saying you see i don't know how the hell mary go but the the easiest one to pick on is the catholics you know what i'm saying because they got the beads and they do a certain number of beads and they feel like the more that they do the better you know what i'm saying but certain rituals they do a, like a certain number they say okay for this ritual you got to do this many beads but each time the bead is like a counter so each time they hit it you know what I'm saying? And they got to repeat this, this, this vain and repetitious prayer, this empty prayer. So it's like, Hell Mary, this, Hell Mary, this, you know what I'm saying? I don't know how this thing go, but whatever, it, whatever it is, they get to praying to Mary. That's the first mistake. You know what I'm saying? It's crazy stuff these people be doing. But then they just, you know what I'm saying? They just move the bead over and they keep going. And it's not just the Catholics, right? The Catholics pick that up from other religions. Right. They picked that up from the pagan religion. So it's not just the Catholics. It's many of these pagan religions that 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 has that type of thing. I think Islam has something like that as well, where where they have a vain, repetitious prayer that they just do over and over again. Um, and this is what the most high God is warning us against right here. 
right? This stuff is not made up. This stuff, this stuff is right here. But nevertheless, you have the biggest. When you ask the average person what is the best representation of the body of Christ or the body of God or the body of the Messiah or the people of God or the people, he the mo the average person is gonna tell you the uh, the Christians or the Catholic Church or whatever. And these very things that Yahushua told us to just stay away from, right? Don't do these things. You know what I'm saying? These are the very things that people like base their whole religion off of. And it's very interesting to see, right? And it's not, again, it's not that these things are sins, right? It's not, he's not, he's not telling you that anybody who repeat a prayer, they a sinner because they repeat a prayer. That's not, that's not what he's saying here, right? He's telling you how to be perfect. But you see these things and he's telling you these are signs of, of people who will be tempted into glory and vanity, right? And pride. And he's trying to teach us to stay away from that glory and that vanity and that pride. All right, keep going. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, our Father, which are in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Right. So he gave us a very short, structured prayer. Right. And the, the, the structure of the prayer fits the structure that we've talked about previously. Right. We always talk about kind of like there's four components in a prayer, we talked about this when we read Daniel. So for, for those that was with us when we read Daniel, Daniel chapter nine, um, Daniel had a very, a very structured prayer. It was much longer than this one, but it's the same, the same components of the prayer, right? So those components are, if you start to go back and start at the beginning, he says, our father who art in heaven, right? So our father up in heaven. So he says, who he is, you know what I'm saying? He identifies y'all, right? Who, who is he to me, right? And then where is he at, right? So our father, which one? The one that's up in heaven. I'm not talking about Joseph. I ain't talking about nobody else. I'm talking about my father who's up in heaven, our father who's up in heaven, right? Then he goes on, he say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So what he's saying there is, He's he's giving them glory. He's saying, like, you the boss. You're gonna run this thing. He's giving them glory. He's acknowledging that who he is, right? So that's always another component, right? Is identify Yah and then you give them glory. And then you have your ask, right? After that, he said, give us our bread, right? Our daily, give us our daily bread. Ain't that what's next? Give us this day our daily bread. Yeah, he said, give us this day our daily bread. And what else? And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Right. So then the next thing that he did is he's confessing his sins, not him, Yahushua, but he's, he's confessing our sins. Right. He said, forgive us our debts. What he's talking about there is our debts to God, what we owe God. We owe God our lives. Right. God owes us death. So that's the exchange. Because we sin, we are in debt to God. We have to give him our lives. He has to give us death in exchange for that. Right? So we have those three components that we've seen so far, right? We have the, the identification, the glory, the ask, and then the last one is the confession of the sin, right? That confession of the sin. So we have the four components. So after he says, forgive us our debts, he's going to go right back into um, the glory. And then he's going to close it out. Watch this. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Right. So it has all four of those components, right? The identification of Yah. <laughs> the glory, right? Us glorifying him. Right. The ask or the request. And then lastly, the confession of sins. Right. That's a well-structured prayer. Now, does that mean that every single prayer has to have all four of those components? No. Sometimes your, your prayer might be simply to praise God. We saw that. We just recently read something like that when we was reading in uh, 
uh who was that uh da, da, da. who was that who was that who was that was that was that uh, maybe it was samuel's mom you remember samuel's mom after after i what it might be samuel chapter three chapter four maybe um she start going she you know what i'm saying she start going up to 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 the temple to see uh or to the uh, uh tabernacle to see uh samuel and she she began to pray and she praised yah in her prayer so in her prayer she didn't have a request most high god had already given her her, her request right so at this point she just a prayer simply to praise yah so in this situation you wouldn't have a request you may not even uh, she didn't even have confessions of sin right she just had the two components where she identified Yah and she glorified him. That's perfectly fine. Nothing wrong with that prayer, right? But these are just four components that we'll often see in a prayer um, that we often see in what we would consider the well-structured prayer. And it fits it fits the bill of what, what Yahushua is telling us here, right? Keep going. Watch this. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. Moreover, when right. you fast. So he's, he's, he's letting us know that our forgiveness from God is tied to our forgiveness for people. Right? Y'all will forgive us based off of how we forgive people. And so that's why people say, you know what? It's you can't hold grudges. And that's important. Right? We can't take stuff personal to the point that we hold grudges because it just doesn't make sense for us. Like, what are we even talking about? Okay, yeah, you did something to me. What am I going to do? Like, what, what is that? What are we talking about? Am I going to get vengeance? And if you're not going to get vengeance, right? So you have to, you have to kind of just walk yourself through this stuff. If I'm going to get vengeance, then I know that I'm going against the law. I'm going against what y'all told me. Make that decision. If you're going to do it, then make that decision. You're just going to do it, and, but acknowledge that. Like, I'm not doing what y'all told me. I'm a sinner, and I am being rebellious to God. Right? Make that decision. You pick a side. You do what you're going to do. But then once you work through that thought and be like, no, nah, okay, I ain't going to do that. Then why would it make sense to hold a grudge against this person? Now what you're doing is you lying. You're not picking a side. You're lying to yourself and you're telling yourself, okay, I'm not going to get vengeance. But then at the same time telling myself, that person needs to pay for this. I'm going to make them pay for it one way or another. Well, that's still vengeance. Right? If you go try to collect your debt, that's still vengeance. You got to let a judge order that person to collect your debt. Right? What do you think happened? When 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 OJ, you know what I'm saying, he lost that judgment. You know what I'm saying? When these people, when these people rigged the system again and he beat he beat the he beat the case where the police tried to plant evidence on him and try to say he murdered, you know what I'm saying, murdered that woman. You know what I'm saying? He beat that case. And then they said they set up a civil suit against him. And after they set up the civil suit against him, they tried to set him up and then they ruled against him there. And then he had to pay all this stuff and give up all this property and all that stuff, right? So then he went. And tried to get his own stuff back is how it was presented to a lot of us, right? But at that point, he had already been, a judgment had been placed against him that that was no longer his stuff. So that was a trap. He go up and he tried to get it himself instead of going and fighting the judgment or appealing or doing anything else. He goes and try to fight it, get it himself. And by doing that, now he's stealing property. That is no longer his. In his mind, it's mine. It's my stuff. Right? But because he didn't go to proper channels, well, now the legal system work against him. And that's how it is for all of us when it comes to the most high God. Right? If there's wrong against, listen, according to our law, right? It's a eye for an eye. If somebody punch me in the eye right now and knock my darn eye out, I can go punch them and knock their eye out right back. Absolutely not. That ain't how our law, our law works. You got to bring that to a judge. And once you bring it to the judge, can you just say it by yourself? Like, man, that person just punched me in the eye. What the judge going to say to you? You got any witnesses? Yeah, who else? You know what I'm saying? Who else? You know what I'm saying? You got, you got another witness? 
you got to have two witnesses. Ain't no matter going to be established unless you got two witnesses. So now you got to have somebody to tell you or him got he got to admit it one or two. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, no, nah, he, he did. He punched him. I saw it. OK, now we can now we got a case and the case still ain't over because you got to hear all the witnesses. The other guy might have a couple witnesses saying, no, I didn't punch him. No, he didn't punch him. No, I saw him too. He didn't punch him. So now the judge got to weigh it out. Be like, okay, where, where do y'all say this might have happened at? And he got to look through all the evidence, and then the judge going to make a call based off of what he hear. He's going to say, okay, you know what? I say, yes, go ahead and punch him in the eye. And only at that point can he punch him in the eye. Or the judge could even say, you can't punch him in the eye, but I'm going to have somebody else punch you in the eye as your punishment. And the same thing you did to your eye, I'm going to have somebody else do it to your eye. But the judge has to make that call. We couldn't even, uh, our law doesn't allow us to take vengeance into our own hands. You're not justified just for, just because somebody killed, you know what I'm saying, killed your brother and you go over there and kill him. That don't make you justified. You become a murderer too. Right? Our law has to put that person to death. Our law has to stone that person. And for that, it has to come through a judge. Well, it's no different with Yah. Right? It's no different from Yah. We have to make sure that we put vengeance in Yah's hands. And by doing that, he will make the world kneel to us. But our problem is not, is not vengeance. Our problem is trust. We don't trust God. But when you don't trust God, you feel like you have to take it into your own hands. When you don't have enough information, when you don't have enough knowledge, even when it's not about trust necessarily, Right. Sometimes you don't know enough. Right. Sometimes it's trust, you know, but it's like, man, I'm not sure that's going to happen the way God said it. Is. You know what I'm saying? We never think we never tell ourselves that thought so clearly in our head because that'd be like too taboo because we're not honest with ourselves. Right. But in honesty, a lot of decisions we make is because, like, I mean, I know the Bible say that, but oh, I know that's really lay out that way. Let me just do it this way. Right. So one issue is trust. Then you got the other side of the issue is sometimes I don't even know that the book say that. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes I don't even realize that that's what the book is saying. I don't even realize that that's what God expected me. I don't even realize that that's God's plan. Then you go taking matters into your own hand. Either way, it's an error. Right. And we have to be very conscious of that. We have to make sure that we know the book enough. That's the first step. And the next step is we got to trust what it say. And if we do that, then vengeance becomes less important to us. Because in my mind, our mindset is, okay, cool. You got that off. You did that to me and you got that off. Now you got to deal with my God. And it's going to be on his time. Might get you swiftly and he might not. But regardless, I trust the man to handle this the way it's supposed to be handled. And then you just keep pushing. That's why it's important that we got to forgive. Because if we don't, we think it's just a forgive. Oh, well, God said, because you didn't forgive so-and-so, he ain't for going to forgive you. It ain't necessarily about so-and-so. You know what I'm saying? It ain't necessarily about so-and-so. It means that if you haven't forgave that person, you don't trust God. You don't understand. You, you, don't, you haven't conceptualized his plan yet. You know what I'm saying? You either don't know it or you don't trust it. Either way, it's a problem. All right, keep going. Moreover, when ye fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear to men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. For right? You... So he said, look, he said, when you fasting, don't be a no darn sad countenance. You know what I'm saying? I remember, I remember the first time I sat fast. That's how I was walking around, looking all beat up. You know what I'm saying? Because I didn't know no better. So I was looking all beat up. You know what I'm saying? I was like, I read this. I was like, ooh, that was wrong. You know what I'm saying? My first fast, I took pictures. You know what I'm saying? Looking all miserable. You know what I'm saying? I was like, oh, that was wrong. Did it for the wrong reason. That thing, it had nothing to do with nothing. Right? Now he set it up. He said, no, 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 no. When you fast. You know what I'm saying? Don't be looking at no sad countenance. I'm walking around, moping around like, ugh. I've been eating all day. A week. He's the Lord. You know what I'm saying? You do that, even people, 
He looked, oh, that's a great man of God. Look how he's suffering for God. Well, if that's why you're doing it, got your reward already. As soon as they get to saying, man, that's a man of God there. If that's the reason why you did it, ooh, you got your reward. That's it. You ain't got nothing coming from God. Because you already got what you were looking for. You got, you know what I'm saying? God know the reason why you did it. That got that. Right? But watch how he tell you to fast. Oh, yeah, all ashy. I'm happy you said that. You know what I'm saying? That's how it be. All ashy, all nice and ashy. You know what I'm saying? Your brother T. Lee? No, I'm right here. Oh, all right. You know what I'm saying? But he's like all, all ashy and, you know what I'm saying, beat up, scarred up, crusty darn lips. You know what I'm saying? Everything. I just, water. No, don't give it to me. I'm fasting. You know what I'm saying? Oh, I'm just so thirsty. Oh, here, brother. I'll give you some water. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm fasting. If only I could just have a little bit to eat. Oh, you haven't eaten? No, 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 no. I'm fasting. You know what I'm saying? All that stuff. It's like, no, nah, that's phony. That's phony. Most our God don't respect that. But watch, watch how he tell you you should fast. But thou, when thou fast, anoint thine head and wash thy face. That you. So that's that's what sister, that's what Sister Sharon was just talking about. She's like, you all ashy. Well, no, the book he tell you, right? The gospel he tell you, y'all. She was like, no, anoint thy face. When he's talking about anoint, he's talking about oil, mm -hmm. right? He's saying pour oil on your face. Get some of that ashiness off of you. Get that stuff off of you. That's our people. It's today, our people use lotion and stuff. I don't use that. I don't use no lotion. I ain't got no time for that. I use oil just like my, my fathers did. You know what I'm saying? But different types of oil is what we use to, to moisturize our skin, right, in the ancient times. So he's saying, I'll put a little bit of oil on. Your, your butter darn ash. Your face look all crusty and dry and cracking. You know what I'm saying? No, I'll put a little bit of oil on. Look nice. Watch what else he said. That thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy father which is in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Lay so not when you fast, you jump out there and make it look like you're not fasting. Right? I remember I was fasting, and uh uh it might have been the last time, the, the last fast that we did, or maybe it was two years ago, but I was fasting, and um I've gotten to the point where I don't Tell, I don't want nobody to know I'm fasting. You know what I'm saying? Like, nobody except for the people I'm doing it with. You know what I'm saying? If I'm doing, I'm doing, I'm fasting with people, then it's like, okay, of course they know. But outside of the people that, that, that I know, I don't want them to know I'm fasting. So I move around like I normally would. If I'm going to work that day, then I go to work. And this time, um, I don't think I went to work, but uh, uh, a, a coworker, if I'm not mistaken, a coworker asked me to go eat. And I was like, I already knew. So I'm looking like, if I say, if I say no, she going to ask me why. You know what I'm saying? I was like, I don't want her to ask me why. So I said, yes, I can pop up for a little bit and then I'm going to head out. Because if I go and I don't eat, she going to ask me why. So I was like, okay, this is how I can avoid, avoid having any questions or anything. Be like, yeah, I'm going to pop up and just get out of there. I just wanted to, you know what I'm saying, celebrate. You know what I'm saying? She had, she had graduated. So I, was like, I just want to celebrate this, that, and that, that, that. So I went up there, you know what I'm saying, did it, and then just got out of Dodge. You know what I'm saying? As if I just had other things that I need to do. But I, boy, I, my goal was to just avoid anybody asking me, why aren't you eating? Or why can't you come? Or wh whatever it might be. You know what I'm saying? But I still show up looking bright, looking good. You know what I'm saying? Oiled on, dressed nice. You know what I'm saying? Then come in, shake everybody's hand, give everybody a hug, and be like, man, I wish I could stay. But I got to get up out of here. Right. And then I move on because it's like you want to present yourself. What, what Yahushua was telling you to be perfect. You would present yourself as if you're not even fasting. Right. As weak as you might feel on the inside, you 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 running, you jogging, you smiling. And then if you can't do that, sit your butt in the house. Sit your butt in the house. Don't be around nobody. If you can't move freely and you can't act regular, then sit your butt in the house. Don't be around nobody. Because if you get in front of people and you get to liking it too much, when they be looking like, oh, man, man, you got to be a strong man of God to be able to fast this long. You get to liking that stuff too much, then you got what you asked for. And you ain't got nothing coming from the most high God. All right? Keep going. 
Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth does, where moth and rust does corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But mm -hmm. lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth, rust, nor do, nor does corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Mm -hmm. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore the eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. Well, let's go back. I, I want to spend a little time on that. He said, where your treasure is. This, this is a very popular saying. I know everyone's familiar with it. But a lot of times the stuff that we've heard a lot from the Bible, don't get. You know what I'm saying? Like a lot of the stuff that like, that's just repeated over and over again from the Bible. It is the those are the most misunderstood things, right? So let's think about this a little bit. He says, where your treasure is, that also is where your heart is, right? And we have to think about how the scripture uses heart. What is heart, right? It's the inside, your emotion, your thoughts. So what he's saying is, you are thinking about your treasure. Your treasure, whatever your treasure is, that's what's occupying your insides, occupying your thoughts and your emotions and your thinking, right? So a lot of people treasure family, right? I treasure family, right? I treasure my kids. I treasure my wife, right? So many of my thoughts are about them, right? Many of my thoughts are about, okay, how is he going to grow up? How is he going to be? Okay, if we keep talking to him like that, is that really going to develop him? Like, okay, if we don't stop him from having this bad habit, what could that develop and turn into? And I'm just obsessing over this stuff constantly. Like, you know what I'm saying? What can we do different? What we do? How does this need to go? How do we change this? This is another. My wife, same thing. How do I make sure she stay encouraged? How am I more encouraged by her? How do I become a better husband? How do I do this? And just constantly, constantly, constantly think about these things. I make it easier around the house. How we make things happen. You know what I'm saying? Okay, if every week we run into this cycle, how can I switch it up to make sure we don't hit this cycle? How do I prevent this argument? How do I do all these different things? And it's constant because that's where my treasure is. So all my thoughts are around protecting my treasure, right? Let's say money is the treasure. And you guys will hear this, right? It's not just money is the treasure like that's my goal. No, it is. It is occupying my heart. In other words, it occupies all my thoughts and my emotions. So that's the people that chase money, that will give up anything for money. That would take you when, when it comes to women, they will put themselves in compromising positions for notoriety and money because that is where their treasure is. They will trade things about themselves. And I'm not just talking about hookers or whores or whatever, right? I'm talking about business women. I'm talking about ambitious corporate women, right? They will trade things for the status or for the money, right? Men, exact same thing, even worse in some cases, right? Men will trade things for their money. They will trade their morals. They will trade their self-respect. They will trade all these things for money. They will look past a whole whole bunch of stuff for money. You got people sitting around that they know. They will sit here and have a whole a whole conversation of how black people need to do this and they need to pull up their self by their bootstrap and black people messed up for doing this and black people die and they black, right? And then you get to talking about Jewish people and be like, no, I'm going to shut up. I don't, you know what I'm saying? I don't want I don't want my TV show to be shut down. I don't want my I don't want my podcast to be shut down. I don't want this that and other. So now it's no longer a principal thing. Right? Things no longer become about principle. All it's about now is my money. Principle stops at the door. And these are, these are guys that, that consider themselves stand up. Right? You have discussions just with people and you see where their treasures are. Right? What they protect. What's most important to them. And when you see that, Yah is telling you, okay, that's your vulnerability. If your treasure is not Yah, that becomes a vulnerability for you, right? Because we have to put ourselves in a position where the only treasure we care about is Yah. And if that's the case, nobody is getting to him, right? 
If somebody run in my house, I'm protecting my house every single time because I have to protect my treasure, my kids, my wife, period, right? Nobody, if my treasure is 100% with y'all, I don't have to worry about nobody running in trying to get that. I don't need to protect y'all, right? So it's a different level of security when you trust him. If my thoughts and my mind, hold, 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 we got, grab uh, Deuteronomy chapter six. Give me Deuteronomy chapter six. Give me verse, I don't know, I probably want verse four. You sure this is Deuteronomy it? chapter six, verse four. It's Deuteronomy chapter 6. Give me verse 4. Hear, O Israel, Yahuwah our God is one Lord, and you shall love Yahuwah thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul, with all thy might. These words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. All right? So he said, Yahuwah thy God is one Yahuwah. That's it. It's just one of them. And he said, you're going to love him with what? With all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. With everything, right? So in doing that, he becomes your treasure because now your heart is completely occupied with him. Right? This is perfection. This is how it's done. If your thoughts are completely occupied with him, the only thing you're trying to protect is your relationship with him, right? How, how he would view you. Because you know that's the only way that something can be harmed with that connection. You know ain't nobody getting rid of him. So it just comes down to, okay, well, how I make sure he don't get rid of me? And if that's the case, then it's like, okay, well, no, nah, I ain't sinning. No, nah, you ain't going to get me to say that. No, nah, I ain't compromising on that because you're trying to protect this relationship. So he's trying to let us know if you get to treasuring this stuff and you start liking this stuff too much, you're going to have to be put in a position to choose. It's going to be Yah or it's going to be you. Right? Let's go back. Let's take a look. We left off probably what? Matthew chapter what? Chapter 6, verse what? 21. 21? Well, 22 now. 22? It's Matthew chapter 6, verse 22. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? No man can serve two masters. Neither He said no man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to one and despise the other. He cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore, right, so he said you try to serve Yah, and you try to serve uh serve mammon, which is talking about like money or wealth, you know what I'm saying? You try to serve both at the same time, it's not gonna work out. Right? You're gonna develop a love for one and you're gonna develop a hate for the other. Right? That's how that's just how it works, because you're trying to serve two things at once. Keep going. Therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on. Is not life more than meat and the body than raiment behold the fowls of the air they sow not neither do they reap nor gather into barns yet your heavenly father feedeth them all are you not much better than they which of which of you by taking thought can add one cubit unto his stature and why take ye thought for raiment consider the lilies of the field how they grow they toil not neither do they spin and yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Mm -hmm. Therefore, if God, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly father knows that you need of all these things. 
But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. All they right, so now he gives you a formula. He says, okay, if you want, I know you care about all these things, but if you seek first the kingdom and you say, okay, how do I make sure I am perfect with Yah? He said, man, you don't even understand. The rest of this stuff is going to be added to you because Yah already knows that you need it. He already knows that you want it. And he'll add all the rest of that stuff to you. But you just have to seek first the kingdom. So then what that does is that challenges our knowledge and our trust. Right. If we know that Yah wants these things for us, well, then that takes care of the knowledge piece. Then the only thing left is trust. Do I really believe that I don't need to worry about food or about a place to live or clothes or anything like that? The only thing I need to worry about is getting right with the most high God. If that is true, then that's cool. I'm going to focus on Yah. It's only when we don't completely trust that that's true that we start to deviate a little. Bit. And sometimes that deviation ain't even a sin. It's just not perfect. And it creates a vulnerability. It creates an opening. And that's where Satan comes in to attack. You will see a lot of the stuff that we read about Yahushua. He is 100% focused. We talked about it. He's talking about don't worry about food, right? We talked about uh, maybe four weeks ago when he sat at the well with the woman. When the disciples came back, what did they ask him? They looked like, man, you hungry? We brought back some food. And Yahushua responded and said, nah, I already got my food. My food is from the Father. Right? It's, it's important to see that he's not just talking this stuff. He has the 1,000% focus that, that he's talking about. And when you have that focus, it separates you from everybody else. And now people have to come to where you are and have to try to live up to the standard that you set. Right. But it allows you to be completely focused on the most high God, which leaves you invulnerable. Right. It leaves you impenetrable to, to the to the attacks of Satan. Because you're perfect. Right. There's no way that he can come in and try to distract you because you're not interested in none of the foolishness. Right. You've proven it to yourself and proven it to others that you're not interested in any of the foolishness. Keep going. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient mm -hmm. unto today, unto the day is the evil thereof. Right? He's saying, listen, it's enough evil today. In other words, it's enough bad stuff happening today than for you to sit here and worry about tomorrow. Right? The wisdom, in, if you take time and really, really think about the stuff that he's saying, the wisdom in it it's just amazing, right? Because he's telling you, he what he's about to say next is really the part that kind of seal the deal. But he's telling you, it's enough bad stuff happening right now. You know what I'm saying? And you you think about next week? You think about the bad stuff that's going to happen about next week? Right? Taking my example, when I think about my kids or I think about my wife, and I'm looking like, okay, well, how this going to be this? How it? I'm worried about stuff years from now. And y'all trying to tell me, like, boy, you don't realize it's enough happening today that you can't handle. What you went through today, you can't handle. You know what I'm saying? Like, you got stuff happening today that if it was all revealed to you, you'll lose your darn mind. Right? And you trying to focus on years from now? You trying to focus on tomorrow? You trying to focus on next week? No, nah, he said, look, it's sufficient to even focus on what's going on today. The evil that's going on today. Watch what he say next, though. Judge not that ye not that ye be not judged. Well, oh, that was the end of the chapter. Yeah, I must be mixing it up with something else. Okay, he said this is uh this is chapter seven. This is uh Matthew chapter seven verse one. He said, "Judge not, lest ye be judged." Mm -hmm. Judge not that ye not be judged, for with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged, and with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. 
right? So this is kind of related to what he is talking about, about forgiveness. He's looking like, look, forgive us in our prayer, right? He said, pray like this, right? Our heavenly father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. In other words, set apart is your name, right? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us the, this day our daily bread uh, and forgive us our debts as we forget out, give our debtors, right? So the same way that I forgive my debtor, right? The person that, that, that owes me money, I forgive them, forgive us our debts, right? So if you think about that concept, he says, listen, if you forgive, then I'll forgive you. That's the concept. That's the picture that he set up. Well, in the same way, he say, well, look, the same way you judge. So like the opposite of forgiveness kind of is judge. Right. When you judge, you have to, it's just about making a decision. So if you have a matter brought before you and it's like somebody's wrong, somebody's right, or at least somebody's wrong. Right. Somebody's the wrong party in this. When you judge, you have to decide, OK, this person's wrong. Right. This is what happened. This person's wrong. So then the opposite of that is forgiveness. Right. Once the judgment comes, OK, this person's wrong. He owes you seventy dollars. Now, the person that is owed seventy dollars has the power to forgive that very same seventy dollars that the judge said you owe. Right. So the, the kind of opposite of judgment is forgiveness. Right. So now on the other side of it, he's saying don't judge or else you'll be judged. The same way that you judge is the same way that y'all will judge you, right? And that's how it works. Y'all uses the same messed up thinking that you're going to apply to the world to justify yourself, to do the stuff that you want to do. He's going to flip it. That's why we say in the beginning, anything you say can and will be used against you in the day of judgment, right? Because the same way that you approached it, the same way that you justified your actions, the same way that you feeling like, you know what? I don't like when people do that to me. And then you turn around and you do the same thing to other people or you do a similar thing to other people. The most High God is going to look when he look when it's judgment day and he put that thing on the big screen. He's going to light your butt up like, oh, no, nah, you know, that was wrong. You knew it was wrong when other people did it to you. You know what I'm saying? When people did it to you, you knew it was messed up and you knew it was wrong and you told them. No, nah, that's wrong. I can't I can't stand when people do me like that. I can't stand when people trick me and lie to me and take advantage of me and manipulate me or whatever. Whatever it is, you knew it was messed up. And then you turned around and you did the same thing to other people. So the same way you felt about them is how I feel about you. Right? And that's how that's how y'all operates. Right? He uses our own judgment against us because he knows that we are hypocrites. Grab uh grab uh second Samuel chapter twelve. Second Samuel chapter twelve, give me verse one. Right? A lot of people use this verse, judge not unless you be judged. And they try to say the man is telling you don't judge. Right? Don't judge anybody. Right? That's not what he's telling you. He's not telling you don't judge anybody. He's telling you the same way that you judge is the same way that you're going to be judged back. So if a person were to judge righteously, judge according to the book, judge according to righteousness, then in that situation, that's how that same person will be judged. Now, if you behave righteously and you judge righteously, guess what? You don't have anything to fear. Right. If you judge people unrighteously, in other words, you look at them and say, OK, well, even though you're not doing anything wrong, I'm going to do something wrong to you. Then most High God is not going to do something wrong to you when you don't deserve it. But even more so is right for him to judge you righteously. Right. But if you judge people righteously and say, no, you truly are wrong and you're right about it. Right. That person's wrong. But then you and your own life are not righteous. Then guess what? Yah is going to judge you with the same veracity that you judge them because you didn't have no mercy. 
You didn't even look at him, just be like, oh, well, you know what? I'll be messing up too. Let me try to help you through this. We both here to try to figure this stuff out. Let me try to help you through this, right? The first thing you do is you look at him and you point out the wrong. Well, start with yourself, right? Point out your own wrong. Watch this. This is uh, 2 Samuel chapter two, uh, chapter 12, verse 1. And Yahuwah sent Nathan unto David. And he came unto him and said unto him, There was two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. Right? You had a rich man, you had a poor man in the city. Right? Watch this. The rich man had exceedingly many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he had brought it, bought and nursed. Right? So the rich man had all types of flocks and herds. In other words, he had a whole bunch of sheep and goat and rams, and he also had a whole bunch of cows and ox and bulls. Right? So he had a whole bunch of sheep, I mean flocks and herds. Right? He had a lot. Right? Keep going. But the but the but the poor man, he only had this one little ewe lamb, one little baby lamb, right? And watch how he felt about this baby lamb. Watch this. Bought and nourished up, and it grew up together with him and with his children. It did eat of his own meat and drink of his own cup and lay in his bosom. It was unto him as a daughter. Right? <laughs> so this lamb was to him like a baby, like a daughter. He raised the thing up to the point where he got a cup and he he a lamb. He drink and he shared a drink with the lamb. The lamb was like, you ever seen one of them people that's too close to their dog? You know what I'm saying? They dog run around. They let their dog lick them all in the face. You know what I'm saying? The dog jump in the bed with them and all that stuff. White people be doing that stuff. But there's some black folk doing it now too. Right? And they be climbing up on the couch with them and all in their business and all that. They take pictures with them all that stuff. I ain't talking about nobody. You know what I'm saying? It's just a love in there. You know what I'm saying? I don't know if there's a love in there. Yeah, I, ain't talk, I ain't talking about nobody. You know what I'm saying? But you know what I'm saying? People be, love, they dog be, listen, they got family pictures with they dog. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? And they love they dog. This is how the ewe lamb was. The little lamb, he raised the lamb up. It was it, baby. He shared his plate and the food with the, the lamb eat right off his plate and drink right out of his own cup. He sit there, take a drink. He give it to the lamb. You know what I'm saying? Go ahead and drink it. I'm trying to watch TV. Then he come back and he drink another sip right after the darn lamb. This lamb is his baby. Right? And then you got this rich man across town. He don't care nothing about his animal. He got so many of them. Don't even know their names. They ain't even got names. This, uh, you know what I'm saying? That's lamb 702. You know what I'm saying? Because that's the, that's the next one that we going to kill next month. When this, You know what I'm saying? When it's time to eat, that boy, whoo. You got him. You got him fat for me, huh? Keep taking care of him for me. Nah, turn him into a coat. Now just shave him up. Turn him to. But that one, oh boy, I can't wait to eat that one. We cooking that one. All right, I'll see you next month when they ready. Right, that boy, the rich man, he got all of them. But then you got the poor man. Man, this is all he got. He ain't thinking about eating this thing or taking nothing from. Him. He just looking like man, it's part of the family. Him and his kids play around. He be riding on it, like, acting like he riding on it sometimes. Like they have fun. Right? Watch what happened, though. And there came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared to take of his own flock and of his own herd to dress for the wayfaring man that was come unto him, but took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was come to him. So now look, the rich man looking like, oh no, I like my lamb. You know what I'm saying? I got plans for every lamb I got. Every darn animal I got out there, I got plans. But guess what? Now he got a visitor. He got somebody coming to town and they need somewhere to stay. And he's looking like, man, no, you can stay here. Uh, let's make something to eat. What you got to eat? I don't want to kill him. I got plans for mine. You know what I'm saying? Go, uh, where that poor man at that got that darn lamb? Go ahead and go take his. Right? He has plenty, but because he don't want to spend it, he said, go take the other one. Go take the poor man's lamb. Watch this. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, as Yahuwah lives, the man that has done this thing shall surely die. Right? What, Na what, what Nathan just presented to David was a case. He said, look, this is the case. We need a judge. We need you to make a decision on this. And David looked at that case and he said, oh, no, no, no. I know that's wrong. 
You go, look, whoever did that, this is David the king. Whoever did that will surely die. He took that thing personally. He said, the let, cause you know, David is kind of like, you know what I'm saying? Like the people that we are talking about. David, David liked the land. He took care of the sheep. You know what I'm saying? He took care of the sheep. He fought a bear and a, and a lion over the sheep trying to save him. Right? He took that thing serious. He took care of the sheep. So when you get to tell him this sheep, this, this lamb was a part of the family. Oh, no, nah, that hurt David Hart. The rich man took his lamb? Are you kidding me? Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, he's wrong. He shall surely die is what David said. Now watch what Nathan says to David. And he, and he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. And Nathan said to David, you are the man. Thus says Yahuwah God of Israel. I anointed thee king over Israel and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. And I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives into thy bosom and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have moreover, I would moreover have given thee such and such things. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of Yahuwah to do evil in his sight, that you have killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and has taken his wife to be your wife, and has slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon? Now therefore, the sword shall never depart from thine house, because thou hast despised me, and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Thus says Yahuwah, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house, and will take thy wives before thine eyes, and give them unto thy neighbor, and he shall be, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of this son. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. All right. He did it what? Secretly. Because we talked about it earlier. Listen, if you pray in the closet or oh, the most high God, he going to reward you openly because you did it secretly. If you hide your arms from your right hand to your left hand, you know what I'm saying? Because you do that secretly, guess how the most high God going to reward you openly. Right. But if you sin against the brother of your people, right, and take his wife and commit adultery and then send the people to, or send, send the man out to go die to cover up your sin. Well, guess what? You did that secretly and I'm going to reward you openly. But remember what David's judgment was. His judgment was this man shall die and he has to restore four times. Four times he has to restore it. So we going to read, those of us that's reading the Bible in a year, we going to read David's life and we going to see exactly what his judgment was ends up coming to him. Right? It's going to end up coming to him because he about to lose one baby son that was born of Uriah's wife. Right? Then he going to lose another son that ended up rape, raping his daughter. Right? His son raped his daughter. Then he going to lose another son. You know what I'm saying? Over, over going to war over that whole little situation. And then he's going to lose a, a, another son, you know what I'm saying, that comes, uh, that comes to, uh, to Solomon. You know what I'm saying? Solomon trying to take the kingdom. Well, not, you know what I'm saying? Well, yeah, trying to take the kingdom. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? His wives, too. Huh? And his wives, too. And his wives. And his wives. Right? So he had, he, he had to restore fourfold. He had to get that back fourfold. For what he did to Uriah. Right? Because Yah used his judgment against him. We'll read it when we get to it and we'll kind of examine it. But it's important to see that that's how Yah works. This is not a new concept. This is this is a concept that 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 has always existed. Yahushua is pulling from the law in our history with this. Right? He's saying, don't judge because you will be judged. That doesn't mean that, you know what I'm saying? That doesn't mean literally don't judge anybody. He's telling you judge righteously, but more importantly, behave righteously. That is the message of what he's telling here. A lot of people try to use to say, don't judge anybody. Don't judge me. Don't the Bible say don't judge? No, 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 no. It's telling you to behave righteously and judge righteously. Watch this. Go back to uh, Matthew chapter seven, verse one.
Judge not that ye be not judged, for with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged, and with that what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but consider not the beam that is in thine own eye? Mm -hmm. For how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye? That All right, so he's saying, what, what sense does it make? So you remember, he's talking about judging. So he's talking about somebody making a decision about who's right and who's wrong. So he's saying, what sense do it make to start to find something in your brother's eye? Be like, hey, man, you got something in your eye, but you don't even see that you got this big old thing hanging out of your eye. You can't even see straight because you got this big old thing hanging out of your eye, but you taking all this time to meticulously point out what's going on in your brother's eye. Man, something wrong with your eye. You know what I'm saying? He's saying, well, why don't look, he'll read it. Go ahead. Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then you shall see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. Right? So you can see the purpose is never to not judge. The purpose is to, re re to behave righteously. That is the main purpose of what he's saying. But a lot of, look, we've heard judge don't judge don't the bible say judge not no no no, no. we heard that so many times right it's it's repeated all the time we've heard it throughout our lives right but you can see the stuff that gets repeated the most from the bible is the most misunderstood always well if they get to see john 3 16 all these different things they just they just if they find something in the book that they can wear out nine times out of ten they wearing it out because they don't get it right and that's what's happening here. People say, oh, the Bible said judge. No, the Bible said don't judge. The Bible said, no, 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 no. What he's telling you is behave right. This really is not even about judging. This is about your behavior. He's telling you don't be a hypocrite. Straighten your own behavior up before you start to looking at other people. Right? That is how you are perfect. That is how you are perfect. Right. Straighten yourself up before you get to run in your mouth about other people. He said it don't make sense for you to feel like you can look in your brother's eye. You got this big old thing in your eye. You can't even see straight. He said first take that thing out and cast it out so that then you can see straight to help your brother with what's going on in his eye. Prior prioritize your uh, righteousness first. Right. Because that's what the message is. Seek ye first the kingdom. If you make your treasure the kingdom, if that's what you think about all day, all night, how do I preserve my relationship with the most high? Right? Then all the rest of that stuff will be added to you, including friends that will change their life in the same way. So you ain't got to like look through their eye and try to point stuff out. Make sure you write first. And then when you write, when you're in a place where you're comfortable, when you have, when you have, when you have confidence in the righteousness of the most high God, well, then that's when you can point out some other stuff. That's when you can start teaching people. That's when you can start leading people along. But it don't make no sense to do that until you get it right. You can't teach the people to, okay, let's use David again as an example. Go to Psalm, Psalm chapter 51. Right? This is, this is a Psalm that David wrote after what happened with Uriah. After he got busted, right? After Nathan came to him and was like, yo, 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 you the man. You know what I'm saying? That man, that, that poor man that you trying to, you know what I'm saying, protect. You know what I'm saying? You the man. You the rich man in this situation. You know what I'm saying? This is Psalm chapter 51. Start me off at about verse 9. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted to thee. Right? So he says, after you restore me, then I'm going to teach transgressors thy ways. Right? Then I'm going to teach people. But first, I got to get it right. Right? That has to be our mindset, because... That's how this stuff works. There's too many teachers out there just jumping out and they ain't got it right yet. You can't even see properly because of all the sin. 
right? You can't even read the scripture properly because of all the sin. First thing you got to do is get yourself right, understand what the books say. Then you can go out and start teaching people and start, start trying to help people out. Why are you going to look at your brother and you got, he got a little speck in his darn eye and you got this big old thing hanging out your darn eye and you ain't even thinking to get it. You ain't even trying to get rid of it. That's too much work. It's easier, you know what I'm saying, to point out stuff with him. Right? That's what the message is here. Again, it's a judge not. That's not the message. The message is your behavior. That's what it always comes down to. Of each and every person's behavior, your own behavior. If you get that right, then you can get into the kingdom. Right? We're going to stop here and then we're going to pick it up next week and finish chapter seven. Right? We're going to finish chapter seven. We, we kind of at the beginning of chapter seven. We're going to finish that chapter seven. This is the last chapter of, of, of him teaching as if he had the authority, right? People, people looking at him like, man, he don't teach like the scribes. He teaches, he have the authority. So this is part two. We'll do next week. We'll do a part three um, of this sermon you know, and or, or, or this teaching, this doctrine that he gives. But I want y'all to just see how different it is, right? How different this is from what, from what we've been introduced to and you can kind of see why the people look at him and like, okay, he's not coming around teaching us like thus says, thus says Yahuwah. And this is what this is what Moses had to say. And you know what? I think this is what Moses meant. Kind of like how I be teaching. When I'm teaching, I'm like telling it, oh, I'm, in my opinion, I think this is happening. Or I imagine it was like this. That's not what he is. He not out there talking about none of that foolishness. He out there and just going straight up like, listen, this is what it is. This is what you need to do. He probably ain't even open up a book. You know what I'm saying? He just walking through and just telling you, this is how you need to be. This is what you need to do. This is how you... And then we looking at it, and we've never heard this stuff before. We looking like, man, this is a bad boy. He teach like, like he run the show. Like, I don't know, like he's the master. That's exactly what the Most High God sent them to do. All right? Any questions? If we got some questions in the chat, I'll give y'all. You know, I don't know what the delay is. I should have counted down what the actual delay is. No questions in the chat. They got all these fireworks going over here. All right, if it ain't no questions, then let's go ahead and pray out. Have a peace, y'all. We'll, we'll catch y'all who join in on the um, fellowship call tomorrow, 4 o'clock Pacific time. If you want the link, don't hesitate to reach, reach out. Um, and any questions that you want to ask, if I shut this down too soon, you can always text the number down there or the email. Um, but we'll talk to y'all. So have a peace.